Uh, good afternoon and welcome to these sessions. It's my, my pleasure uh, <clears throat> to welcome to everyone to these sessions and I'm very proud of this, um, this seminar that we will review. So currently was the state of art of sarcoma currently. <clears throat> and obviously you know that, you know, so in cancer and much more in, in sarcoma, we need an entity approach and it means that we need to put together all the specialists uh, working around the sarcoma patient uh, from all these specialists. And, and even more because we know uh, a much uh, deeper approach uh, to understand what's happening in the molecular biology of tumor. And it means that at least uh, <clears throat> sarcoma, the best approach that we can do is much more thinking about what could be the, the, the different uh, genetic alteration that could be potential targets uh, for treating the, the patients in sarcoma patients with the new therapy. And even beyond, because uh, biomarkers right now are able to identify those spaces that could be so potentially better candidates for being treated with radiation therapy and as well for other uh, local therapies and even for those spaces that probably could be the right patients and the right moments for performing any surgical resection. So we will try to review all these different approaches and as well, what could be the right scheme uh, for each uh, sarcoma patients, the updates, the uh, the, uh, the, the last advance that we have uh, in sarcoma. Uh, and, and that's really exciting. Uh, uh, so it's a really interesting era because you know that we have uh, more data from molecular biology and as well uh, from the combination of different uh, therapeutic approaches that can be available for these patients. So um, uh, let me to thank to Javier, Nadia, Yetrif and all the NDT uh, sarcoma team because uh, it's really exciting to join our weekly uh, tumor board uh, and to listen and to learn a lot about what is currently the best approach for our own uh, sarcoma patients. So, and, and finally, let me to introduce our first uh, table discussions that will be uh, that. Uh, that we will review the diagnostic approach and we will see so you know so the different new updates about at least some, some potential sarcoma and this uh, diagnostic approach uh, table discussion will be chaired by uh, <clears throat> Begoña Guterres San Jose and Perfección Dominguez Franjo and that's my pleasure <clears throat> uh, to introduce uh, both uh, argument. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this uh, afternoon talking about sarcomas. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with this fantastic team. Uh, my talk is about all the glitter is not gold. So uh, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present you five tips from five cases. And starting with the first case is a 30 year old patient with no personal history of interest. Uh, that present with a two month evolution lamp on the second finger. Uh, at first, uh, he doesn't have pain, but uh, after that, he uh, starts with a very painful uh, mass and uh, with rapid growth. Uh, there is no other, uh, uh, nothing of interest. And we have uh, two x rays, AP and lateral views, where we can see uh, is like a big mass uh, here and a continuous periosteal reaction. The patient also uh, had performed an MRI. And here, this is a sagittal view of a, a gradient echo uh, MRI, where we can see the, the lesion around the flexor tendons. And we, do, we don't see here any fo focus of uh, uh, hypo-intense hypo uh, uh, areas, which represent hemosiverin in this sequence. Uh, we also have a uh, contrast and enhanced MRI here, axial view with uh, uh, intense uh, enhancement uh, after contrast uh, intravenous injection. And this is a, a MIP reconstruction where we can see that the lesion is solid, it's it has vascularity. Uh, as I say, we, we uh, uh, got the patient in all the machine that we have in the uh, radiology department. And we also uh, did an, uh, a PET CT what we can see here is that the lesion has FDGA uh, uh, contrast enhanced. And also we, we perform an ultrasound, everything. And here in the ultrasound, we have a heterogeneous mass uh, with a Doppler ultrasound inside the lesion. 
Uh, this sequence that we, we will talk about later is a uh, diffusion and we don't have a very, uh, we don't have restriction of the diffusion. And this is a T1 and T2. In the T1, we have a, a deletion is around the tendons and it has a it's an intense uh, signal respective to the muscle. And in the T2 images, we have some, some uh, areas inside the lesion uh, which are uh, hypo intense that represent normally a fibrous tissue. So in resume, we have a, a fast growing tumor with a non aggressive homogene homogeneous periosteal reaction in the phalanx, in the proximal phalanx of the second uh, finger. Uh, the lesion has a vascular enhancement and has a Doppler ultrasound in the, uh, the, in the ultrasound. So it's solid and it has vascularization. Uh, with, uh, it has a cellular component with no areas of bleeding or hemosiderine in the uh, gradient echo. Uh, it has a habit uh, for the FDG and this represents that uh, uh, it has uh, it, it may be tumoral, but also it may be inflammatory or infectious, not necessarily malignant. And we also have some kind of fibrous tissue inside the lesion. So uh, some of you can think that this is a sarcoma, but it's not a sarcoma. It's a florid reactive peristitis, which is a rare benign lesion, very typical from this location in the hand. And it also, it's, it's, it's a kind of different, it's quite different diagnose these kind of lesions as the same that we happen with the myositis ossificans. Uh, the differential diagnosis of the lesion, it could be a sarcoma and also an infection. Uh, so here we, ha we have another, we have another uh, tricky lesion, which is the ossifican my myositis that is kind of difficult to diagnose with the Mayan test. And in this first MRI, is, it may be difficult to differentiate the, this lesion with the sarcoma. Uh, in the evolution of the lesion, we, we can see the, the calcification that help us to the eggshell uh, type calcification that help, help us to differentiate and to diagnose. So, and remind also another tip is that the, not everything that has FDG uh, enhancement is malignant. This is a, a, a patient with a breast cancer and it has an intra-articular lesion, which is a, a bionodular synovitis and it, it, is, it is not a, a, a malignant lesion. So the tip here is to recognize these lesions as uh, the florid reactive peristitis is very typical location and to avoid diagnose this as a, a sarcoma. Uh, we go through the second case. It's a 44 year old woman with a palpable uh, lab in the left side of years of, of evolution and the primary care uh, doctor uh, refer us the patient for an ultrasound. So here we have the ultrasound in September. We have a very uh, hyper echohenic lesion inside the muscle. Actually, it's in the vasto lateralis and is hyper intense with res uh, respect to the muscle ad uh, adjacent. And we also have a vessel inside the, the lesion in the ultrasound, in the Doppler ultrasound. So we perform a, a CT uh, one month later and we can see that the lesion is inside the muscle is kind of hypo, hypo dense respect the, the uh, for example, the rectus femoris. And we have uh, this kind of vessels inside the muscle. Uh, we can see here in a vascular uh, reconstruction, how uh, this uh, prominent vascular vessel is inside the lesion. So we also perform an, an MRI. And in the MRI, the lesion is hyper intense respect to the muscle is the same signal as the, soft, uh, the subcutaneous fat. And as we see in these sequences that is fat suppressed, we can see that the, the lesion also suppresses the fat. So we can say that this lesion has fat. Uh, when we uh, perform a fluid sequence uh, uh, here in the D, DP fat sat, we can see that the, this lesion has some kind of septa. And we can see in the contrast enhancement that it has some uh, contrast enhancement inside the lesion. So uh, the thing is, uh, this lesion is hibernoma, and we have to don't confuse this lesion with the liposarcoma, which is the, the, the diagnosis, the differential diagnosis. Uh, some kind of uh, curiosity about this lesion is that if we put the hand uh, over the lesion, we're gonna have increased local temperature because, because of the hypervascularity of the lesion. Um, 
Here we have another case of a hibernoma in the pectoral uh, in the left pectoral muscle. In a 44-year-old woman, we can see that the lesion is very typical fat suppresses with this kind of vascularity inside. So the tip in this case is to think about hibernoma when we have a, uh, it can be inside the muscle or also uh, it makes uh, it has make of fetal brown uh, fat, which is uh, metabolic uh, activity. It has metabolic activity, and that's why it has prominent vessel and septa. So we can we can, we have to think about this. The third case is a 71 year old man, and he was a Alcaraz nuclear power plant worker, and he came to the to to our department for for a soft tissue mass in the right side of several weeks of evolution. Uh, in this case, we can see a big mass in the right side. Uh, is, is so intense respect, respect to the muscle in the T1 sequences and in the T2 sequences, it is uh, bright in the T2, in the T2 sequence. So uh, here we perform a, a, a sequence which is called uh, diffusion. And we have to know about diffusion that we perform uh, uh, the sequence is diffusion and we have the, the complementary uh, sequence, which is the ADC. So here we can see that, the, um, excuse, sorry, that uh, it has restricted diffusion. The diagnosis of this patient was made by a biopsy and it was a grade three follicular lymphoma. And I'm not going to talk much about the lymphoma, but just to remind what is the, the diffusion? What can help us uh, to diagnose sarcomas or lesions? Uh, what we can see uh, when we have a, a cellular lesion with too much uh, component of cellular, the movement of the, of the molecules around this lesion uh, because of the water is restricted when we have too much, too many, too many cells as it happens in the lymphoma. When the lesion has too many liquid, as we see, for example, in the cystic lesion or necrotic, it's gonna be uh, facilitated, the, the, the diffusion. Uh, the, cell, the cells are gonna move uh, easily around the water. So the, this, the, so the, the diffusion is gonna be facilitated, not, not restricted. When we see restriction in the diffusion, in the diffusion we're going to be hyper intense in the diffusion sequence and hypo intense in the restrict in the in the ADC. So uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to, to speak too much about the about this, but it's very nice when we have a lesion brightly hyper intense in T2. Uh, we can, we can think about myxomas, a uh, lesion with uh, cystic inside as the cystic neurogenic, uh, neurogenic tumors. And other tumors are the as the synovial sarcoma, uh, but the important here is that this uh, lesion with cystic component are going to have facilitated the, the the diffusion, as we see here in the synovial sarcoma and this ancient or cystic is one is one one. So the tip here is uh, uh, in the cases that we have restriction of the diffusion, uh, we have to think about lymphoma. Uh, we have to think also in uh, small cell tumors. It's not pathognomonic of lymphoma, but we have to think, think about lymphoma. The fourth case is a 25-year woman with a purple mass in the left leg of years of, of evolution. And here we have a lesion inside the muscle, the solid muscle. Uh, here we have a T1 sequence, and we can see that the lesion is hyper intense in T1. And we also have here that it has level, uh, liquid, liquid level, and the, the, it has this appearance of uh, vessels, like anomalous vessels. So when we see these lesions, we, we also have a, an ultrasound where can we see this small vessel in the Doppler ultrasound. And we also can see these images are, are hyperconic with a small shadow or shadow, and these are called flavolites. So this lesion is a venous malformation. We don't have to confuse them with uh, sarcomas. And yes, uh, they, have, they, have, they can be everywhere. Uh, in the muscle, in the synovial tissue, in the soft tissue, and uh, in the uh, and in the skin also. Uh, there are five types of uh, histological subtypes. I'm not going to. But the important thing here is to know what the things are hyper intense in T1, and this is a mnemonic technique in Spanish, which is me saco un gran moco duro. Are the things that are hyper intense in T1. So as we see, there are the melanin, melanina, sangre blood, grasa, fat, moco, or duro, or hueso. So if we see fat, we see two cases. One case that we have fat suppressed, and it was in hibernoma, it has fat. And in our case, with hyperintensity one, 
and has blood. So this is very important to do a good diagnosis. Uh, we have to be careful because some sarcomas have bleeding inside and can be hyper intense in T1. Uh, this is another case, another uh, venous malformation. As we see, we have here a hyper intense respected to the muscle lesion in the palmar radialis. And, the, and is, this is the, sur the surgery, the surgery piece. It's a palmar radial venous, venous malformation. So the tip here is, I said, hyper, hyper intense in T1, it can be blood and flavolites in, in ultrasound or in X-ray is pattern pneumonia of venous malformation. Uh, case five is 72 year old man with a palpable lamp in the left knee with pain, month of evolution. We have an X-ray, uh, AP and lateral uh, view, where can we see, we, we can see here a big mass with uh, a cortical bone erosion in the lateral uh, distal part of the femur. And an MRI was performed, and this big mass was heterogeneous. And in T1, this image on T2, uh, some kind of uh, hypo intense, very hypo, in, uh, hypo intense uh, areas in T1 and T2. It has erosion of the bone. And we also saw here another similar lesion just uh, on top of the insertion of the proximal uh, patellar tendon. Here we can see the lesion. And this lesion is. Uh, has something related with this guy. Anyone knows who this, who this guy is? Who? Uh, yeah, Charles I from Spain, Charles V uh, fifth from the Germany. This is uh, from the Extremadura, El Monasterio Juste. And he is, uh, he had, or he died, actually they, they think he died because of the uh, gout. So uh, this lesion in the knee wasn't a sarcoma. It was a uh, gout toffee, which are very typical from the knee. Actually, in this uh, typical location is very typical, but we can see it uh, everywhere, mostly in the knee or in the foot, around the, the joints and around the tendons. This is another case with a small gout toffee in the popliteal tendon, the typical location in the first metatarsal joint of the foot, and here not, not as typical with the typical calcification around the tibialis and the anterior tibialis tendon. And we can we have to think also and be careful with the just the uric acid, the gout toffee, but also with the when we see a, a mass around the joint, uh, we have to be careful and don't confuse with this, ki this kind of uh, hydrosyapatite uh, periarthritis, which is uh, uh, because of hydrosyapatite uh, uh, crystals. Um, so the tip here is, if you doubt, it is gout, and be careful about these lesions. And yes, an extra case, just the last one, uh, seven-year-old male with history is false. Uh, we can see here the T1 and uh, T2 sequence with fat suppression, and we see here a bone lesion in the proximal tibia. Uh, we can think here, we, we, we also have a coronal T1, coronal T2, and sagittal T2 image. Uh, here we can think that uh, there is a preosteal reaction, there is some kind of uh, uh, surrounding mass, and we can think about a malignant lesions as osteosarcoma or even uh, other things. No? Uh, the thing is that we have, when we have a lesion like this, we have to perform an X-ray. Here is the AP uh, X-ray where we see the lesion. The lesion is in the, in the proximal diaphysis of a tibia. And we can also see that the, 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 the child has history of uh, fall. And we can see here also the fracture. Uh, it's very important in radiology always to perform two uh, projections because it's not the same, the image in the left and the image in the right. So here we can see that the lesion is not, is not uh, central medullary. Uh, is eccentric, and this is very typical uh, for a benign lesion, which is very typical around the knee, around the, the ankle, which is called non ossifying fibroma. We see it all the time, but the, the bad thing here is that the, that the guy fall and got a fracture in, the, in that place. So uh, this can be uh, tricky for us, and we can make a wrong diagnosis with the imaging test. So the tip here is that we can wear hat and umbrella and we can have fleas and lice. So be careful. So yes, finishing the tips for, for home are 
uh, be careful with the tricky lesions, the florid uh, reactive periostitis and the ossificum myositis, myositis uh, which are very typical location, very typical history, but sometimes are tricky and very difficult to diagnose. Um, be aware of the, uh, if we have FDG uh, contra enhancement, it doesn't have to be malignant. Uh, be careful with the lesion that could be liposarcoma, but they have fat and they have uh, high vascularity with big vessel inside, could be an ivernoma. Um, the diffusion of the, the, the restriction of the diffusion, uh, it may help us to diagnose a lymphoma. The hyperintense T1, remember the mnemonic uh, technique, uh, blood, fat, and be careful with the flavolites are, are very typical from venous malformation. Uh, if you doubt, it is gout, just think about around the knees or, or around the foot, and even in patients with hyperuricemia. Um, be careful because we can wear a hat and umbrella, and we can have flies and lice, so uh, uh, we can have a benign lesion with uh, uh, an opinion of malignant. So thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this workshop this afternoon. So the subject I'm going to talk about is a very rare adipocytic uh, tumor, a new entity which is called mixoid pleomorphic liposarcoma. So the presentation is going to be as it follows. First is a case presentation, then a brief uh, literature review, and then a few take home messages. <clears throat> okay. So our patient was is a 29 years old male without relevant clinical history uh, who smoked about two, two cigarettes per day and presented in the ER room because uh, in August of 2021, he presented with left chest pain, the, uh, mechanical type of a few days of evolution with associated low grade fever and it was treated with acetaminophen. The patient didn't have dyspnea, cough, or other symptoms. And on physical exploration, uh, it was interesting that the patient had decreased breath sound and roncus in the left lung base. PCR for SARS-CoV-2 was negative. So because of these symptoms, the patient was performed a, a thorax uh, chest radiography. And as you can see here, there is a left pleural effusion which is okay. consistent with a decreased uh, breath sounds. So in that moment, the patient uh, could uh, blood cultures and urine cultures were taken and it started the workup of uh, imaging studies on the patient. So then it was performed a chest CT scan. And as you can see in the area where the pleural effusion is, there is a lobulated mass of about 11 centimeters diameter, maximum diameter. So because of the suspicions of malignancy, a, a biopsy was performed on this patient. This is what we received at, at our department, two cores of a mesenchymal neoplasm. And as you can see in this low power image, is a tumor moderately cellular with a change in, in the stroma because we have a little bit of mucoid or mixed background, but there are some areas also that are fibrous. On a higher power, you can see that the tumor has a, at least in this area, has a very mixed, a very typical mixed background with small cells, bland cells, but scattered in between the small cells, there are some that are a little bit bigger and more, at, more atypical, more hyperchromatic. There were also some uh, multi, uh, multinuclei cells and some multivocalated lipoblasts. As you can see on higher power, uh, these are florid like uh, multinucleated cells. And you see a background of small cells, relatively bland, but it's also scattered uh, bigger cells with more atypia, more uh, hyperchromatia, and even mitotic figures. And on uh, the other hand, there were also multivocalated lipoblasts, as the ones as you see here, which are these cells. 
Nonetheless, the, the tumor wasn't all bland. As you can see, it wasn't that homo homogeneous as we used to see in mysoid, classic mysoid liposarcoma, but there were some transitional areas like the one in here where cellularity was higher grade, more atypical, and the vascular pattern that we see in the lower grade areas was starting to, to get lost in these areas. In the fibrous area that I talked, uh, that I described previously, uh, we see that the cells are even uh, more atypical and the vascular pattern is not as evident as we, we've seen before. This is a high power view of the fibrous area where most of the cells are atypical and if you get only a biopsy of this place, you will call this a high-grade sarcoma, high-grade pleomorphic uh, spindle cell sarcoma. And here you can see also a mitotic figure in the center of the image. In immunohistochemical stains, what we see is that the tumor had sedative, a few cells were CD34 positive, but the most important is that CD34 highlights the arborizing capillary pattern typical of mixoid liposarcoma. But in the areas of fibrous uh, stroma, this capillary pattern was mostly lost. And what we see are vessels with dilated lumens. S100 was negative in this tumor only a lipoblast in the center, which is positive, this brown cell, brown cytoplasm cell. And we perform immunohistochemistry for MDM2, which is typical of atypical lipomatous tumor or well-differentiated liposarcoma. And as you can see, all nuclei are blue, which means the immunostain is negative, right? So with these uh, um, features that we've seen, there isn't a typical sarcoma when, where we can diagnose this, this tumor, right? So we call it pleomorphic sarcoma with mixed stroma and high-grade atypia. And after that, because of the, of the entity that we're going to talk about, we perform fish analysis where we see that the tumor had no full EWSR1, DDIT3 gene fusions, neither MDM2 amplifications. The FOS EWSRT, EWSR1, DDITT gene fusion is typical of mixed soil liposarcoma. MDM2 amplification is, is the hallmark of well-differentiated liposarcoma and de-differentiated liposarcoma. So this patient was then discussed in our multidisciplinary tumor board. And because of the aggressiveness that we're seeing in the, in the uh, radiologic uh, studies and also in the histological tissue that uh, histological study that we, we perform, the patient uh, received adjuvant treatment. He received six, six cycles of epirubicin plus ephosphamide, and there was a slight decrease in the size of the tumor from 12 centimeters to 11 centimeters, but most importantly, there was a, a stabilization in metabolic uh, imaging studies. After that, uh, when patient finished this chemotherapy, uh, a resection was performed of the tumor. And this is the macroscopic view of the surgical specimen. And as, as you can see, the tumor has a very uh, heterogeneous surface where you can see some areas that are chalk white. Some other areas are very hemorrhagic. There is there are some areas similar to the first part of the biopsy where you can see mucoid, these glistening areas that you see here. And the pulmonary parenchyma was not infiltrated by the tumor because it was based on the pleura. So this is the resection, a photomicrograph of the resection uh, specimen. Here in, in low power, what you can see is a fairly bland Mm, mixoid neoplasm with very few cells that they look mostly almost benign and with very uh, small vessels in the background in the in the mixoid stroma in the lower in the upper right part of the photograph what we see are hemorrhoids because mm -hmm. the patient had uh, therapy related changes in this photograph, you can see the pleura, which was 
broaden and the tumor was below below the below the pleura but the pulmonary parenchyma was just re rejected to the periphery but not but was not infiltrated on high power this area of the tumor was pretty much like the biopsy where you see a small bland cells that were a mix admixed with higher grade cells with pleomorphic nuclei and hyperchromatic nuclei. And you can also see some scattered multivalvulated lipoblasts, like the ones you see here and here, also here. But there were some areas where tumor was transitioning to a higher grade area, and the, there was an increase in, in cellularity. Nonetheless, in this area, there was still the typical vascular pattern, the typical small, delicate branching uh, capillaries in the background. This is an area that had some change, some therapy related changes with some vessels, dilated vessels, congested vessels. And you see the, the different morphology of the cells. Some of them are small and fairly bland and some other are hyperchromatic. And there were also some uh, multinucleated lipoblasts and a few univacolated lip lipoblasts. However, in other areas, the tumor was completely different. And there wasn't that apparent uh, mixoid stroma that we've seen so far, but the tumor had more uh, of an appearance of uh, undifferentiated pleomorphic uh, sarcoma, uh, a spindle cell high-grade sarcoma, such as this. In this area, also, the tumor had a necrosis, as the ones you see here, these blue, fairly blue areas that we see here, and some edema in the central part. So on higher power, this is one of, the, of those transitional areas where uh, tumoral cells are becoming more and more atypical in the area where we can see only a uh, pleomorphic spindle cell neoplasm, uh, neoplasm high grade, right? This is a bigger detail on, on even higher power that you see that this spindle cell uh, neoplasm with readily mitotic, mitotic activity. And this is an area, a bigger uh, photograph, a higher power photograph of the ne tumoral necrosis. It, uh, but even though we've, we found this fascicular pattern of the tumor in between, this high grade spindle cell sarcoma, we could find some scattered multivacolated pleomorphic lipoblast. And this is a typical characteristic feature, not of a mixoid liposarcoma, but of, of a pleomorphic liposarcoma. There were, there were also areas where there were even more uh, pleomorphic lipoblasts, some univacolated, some multivacolated, and with the immunohistochemistry for S100, we can highlight these uh, adipocytic uh, malignant cells, right? Which is the one, these brown cells that you can see here. We performed some uh, immunohistochemical stains on the tumor, some basic immunohistochemical stains, basically to, to study the high-grade area. And as you can see, this is pancytokeratin A1, A3, and it's negative. This is a marker for epithelial neoplasia. Sometimes sarcomas can, can have epithelial markers. Uh, about muscular uh, markers, we only the tumor only stain for caldesmon, which is also on a specific and fibroblasts and micro, myofibroblasts can be positive, but the other muscle markers, uh, smooth muscle acting and desmin were negative. S100, that is a marker for adipocytic, as you have seen with the li lipoblasts, but mostly for neural neoplasia and other types of tumors was negative. For example, melanoma, CD34 was negative and what you've seen highlighted here at vessels, and MDM2, which is typical of uh, well-differentiated liposarcoma, is also negative. Um, interestingly, P16 is highly positive in the neoplasia. RB1, which is uh, stands for retinoblastoma 1 protein, that is a characteristic, it, there is a characteristic loss of, of RB1 in pleomorphic liposarcoma, is somehow lost. There are some cells that are positive, but some of them are faintly positive and 
some are negative and what you see on the on the right on the far right is p53 that that was overexpressed almost all tumoral cells were positive so taking in consideration the clinical presentation the uh, uh, radiological features uh, macroscopic examination of the specimen Mic micro, uh, microscopic and microscopic examination of the specimen, immunohistochemical stains and molecular uh, techniques that were performed before, we uh, diagnose this tumor as a mixoid pleomorphic liposarcoma. It's a grade two, grade three histologic grade, the highest grade, and it has a mitotic rate of almost uh, 11 mitosis per square millimeter. Uh, tumor necrosis was less than 50% because it's intermixed with therapy-related changes. And there was also treatment effect, as the imaging said, about 45-50% of the tumor was viable. Okay, so now I will do a, a brief review of the literature about this tumor. So the first uh, paper that finally was able to describe this entity was this paper from 2009 from the American, American Journal of Surgical Pathology from Alayo, uh, Dr. Sharon Weiss and Andrew Folpi. And what they did, they studied 82 lip liposarcomas in patients, in young patients. Mixed soil liposarcoma is a typical sarcoma of adults, not in, not in young patients, but it's the most common type of liposarcoma in children and young patients. And that's why they gather this information from these, from these patients. So fish analysis was performing these tumors for FAS, EWSR1, CHOP or DDIT3, and MDN2, at least in 30 cases. The tumors were distributed 28 in males, 54 in females. The, pre the predominant histology in this study was classical mixed soil liposarcoma in 56 cases, Two cases has uh, had around cells areas, which is now called the high-grade mixed soil liposarcoma. But most of the cases in these young patients had a good prognosis because most of them were grade one, 56 cases, and only two cases grade three. At follow-up, we can see that the good behavior that these uh, tumors had in young patients because 37 of 38 of these patients were alive without disease. Some of these patients were lost during the study, so there is no clinical information. FOS CHOP or FOS DDIT3 and EWSR1 CHOP rearrangements, rearrangements were identified by FISH in 15 of 23 and 2 of 23 but only on classical mixed soil liposarcomas and not the other sarc sarcomas of the study. And amplification for MDM2 was absent in all cases. Most importantly, as, as, as I said in this paper, they described two types of novel liposarcoma. One of them was a spindle cell mixed soil liposarcoma, which I think at this moment is considered a subtype of classical mixed soil liposarcoma. And as you can see, there is the mixoid background with fairly blunt blend, uh, cells with a very uh, prominent vascular branching, delicate br uh, vascular patter, uh, pattern, but the cells, instead of being bland and small and oval, are more uh, uh, elongated. So they described six, six cases, five females and one male. Most of the cases were in the site. 40% and most of them were grade one, all of them, sorry, were grade one. So the follow-up, the, the patients did well at, during the follow-up. Only local recurrences in two cases and metastasis in one case. The other type of liposarcoma that they described, they call it pleomorphic mix of liposarcoma, which is the, the talk that we are explaining right now. And they uh, found 12, 12 cases, which had eight females and four male patients, often involved the mediastinum. The tumor grade was grade two and grade three, but uh, contrary to the other types of liposarcoma in young patients, these ones uh, behave badly because of 10 patients that they had for follow-up, seven died of disease, one was alive with disease, and two were disease-free. 
and none of the, of the tumors show FOS DDIT3 nor EWSR1 DDIT3 rearrangements or MDM2 amplification by fish. So what happened during this, these things during these 10 years? Well, this entity was recently uh, described in the blue book in the WHO blue book of, of tumors of soft tissue and bone. And last year during June of 2021, uh, 2021, David Crittens, Andrew Folpi and others try to understand uh, what's going on in these tumors in the molecular level. So they did a small case, a series of 12 cases, but they did a very thorough study of them that included clinical pathological, immunohistochemical, and molecular genetic and epigenetic features of these tumors. So this is what we're gonna see. They perform several uh, genetic studies in these tumors that included fluorescence in situ hybridization, fish, shallow whole genome sequencing, WGS, and genome-wide DNA methylation profiling. What they found is tumors were uh, six fem uh, cases were six female, six male, ranging from 17 to 58 years old. Here, the age was a little bit higher than in, in the original paper. They were located mostly in mediastinum, five cases, but also, but also in, in other areas, back, neck, the thigh. And histologically, what they found and what is important for diagnosis for, for us pathologists is that there is a combination of features of classical mixed soil liposarcoma and classical pleomorphic liposarcoma. In fish analysis, also they confirm the presence of mononylic RB1 deletion in eight of, of 12 cases. And none of the cases, again, found rearrangements of DDIT3 gene or amplification of MDM2. These are the, the shallow hole, the, the, the image that they show for the shallow hole gene, genome sequencing. And in, in, in a few words, what they found is that these tumors have complex chromosomal alterations with whether gaining of number of chromosomes or, or losses. In these cases, they found gaining in chromosome one, six to eight, and 18 to 21, and losses in chromosome 13 also in, in 16 and 17. Importantly, for, interestingly, in, in this loss, in these tumors, the loss of chromosome 13, especially the long arm of chromosome 13 is where the locus of RB1 is located. So this, there is a, a relationship of the molecular basis of this tumor in mixoid pleomorphic liposarcoma, the same that it occurs in pleomorphic liposarcoma, in the conventional pleomorphic liposarcoma. Even though clinical imaging, location of the tumors, the age of the patients is completely different. And in genome-wide DNA, DNA methylation profiling, they found that these red and brown dots that you see here represent mixoid pleomorphic liposarcoma and pleomorphic liposarcoma cases. And this one over here in the upper part, black dots or gray dots represent mixoid, classical mixoid liposarcomas. So they say that the DNA methylation profiling of mixoid pleomorphic liposarcoma is more similar to, ple to conventional pleomorphic liposarcoma than to mixoid liposarcoma, than classical mixoid liposarcoma. Uh, so the take home messages, as you have seen, mixoid pleomorphic liposarcoma is a rare aggressive adipocytic neoplasm that typically occurs in children and adolescents, in contrary to mixo classical mixoid liposarcoma that occurs in young uh, adults and pleomorphic liposarcoma that tends to occur in all patients. It has a predilection for mediastinum instead of the extremities, but it can occur also in the thigh, head and neck, perineum, abdomen, back, etc. There is a high associ association of this tumor with leaf from any syndrome, numerical chromosomal aberrations, as you have seen, and inactivation of RB1 tumor suppressor gene. And character uh, the, the characteristic feature is the mixed histological features of conventional mixoid liposarcoma and pleomorphic liposarcoma in the same tumor. 
Contrary to what happens in mixed soil liposarcoma, there are no FOSI WSR1 DDIT3 gene fusions, nor MDN2 amplification as we have seen in well differentiated, de differentiated liposarcoma. And unfortunately for patients, the, these patients had back prognosis with high recurrence day, rate and metastatic, frequent metastasis to lung, bone, soft tissue, and an overall poor survival. So these are, uh, this is the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Nadia, Dr. Jesus, and Dr. Javier for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here with you all and I think we will have a, a great discussion today. So um, I have nothing to disclosure. And to talk about uh, uh, limb sparing surgery, I couldn't, uh, I could not say something about the ISO society. Uh, in the 70s, 50% of the patients with extremity sarcomas were treated with amputation and the concept of limb salvage increased after the 60s with the improvement of imaging techniques, advanced therapies and segmental in the prosthesis. The first international workshop to talk about limb salvage was held in 1981 and later this workshop would become the ISOs meetings and the ISO society. So this picture was me in my first ISOs meeting in 2013, and uh, it was a very good meeting in Bologna. So as you all know, the treatment of the sarcomas requires a multidisciplinary approach, and the tumor board is very important and should include radiologists, pathologists, surgical oncologists, medical oncologists, and radiation oncologists. So this picture is from uh, a conference held in Brazil this year, a uh, tumor board to discuss uh, sarcomas. And uh, for diagnosis and treatment, the tumor board nowadays is essential. So we make a decision for our patient treatment. So the sarcomas are a very diverse group of diseases and the treatment should be individualized. We have the bone sarcomas and the soft tissue sarcomas. And we also have the, tr the treatment in children and adults. So we have uh, a very diverse kind of patients as well. In the past, the challenges were the high number of amputations, inaccurate surgical margins, low survival rates, large areas of irradiation, and few chemotherapy protocols. So what changed? Uh, now we have an overall survival of 75% of patients in, in some hospitals more than that. And this is because we have now multiple protocols of different sarcoma histology, chemotherapy protocols, chemo and radiotherapy protocols associated, combined. Uh, we also have a better uh, radiotherapy with 3D techniques and they allow a more conformal dose of distribution to the target volumes and we can do that as a preoperative or postoperative protocols. Regarding the margins, we have better MRI technique, the diffusion that uh, our friend just talked, and the 3D planning. So the navigation, the navigation surgery, uh, allows us to do more accurate margins as well. The endoprosthesis and biological reconstruction uh, helped us to get smaller the number of the amputations 
and now we, we can match the 8% limb sparing surgery. So watch which are our new challenges. Uh, the advances in, in the prosthesis field provide the possibility of less amputation, mostly when associated with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. This is a Brazilian endoprosthesis with polyethylenum and titanium, and it has modularities and different kind of uh, reconstruction. Um, for our country, it's a very cheap kind of reconstruction. But we have many endoprostheses in the market. This is the one that I think that you should, you must use here. It's a motors from implant cast. It's a very good endoprosthesis with metal. And it also has a droxapatitis coated prosthesis, So we can do better fixations. We can fix uh, whole uh, femur, whole humerus, and uh, the total joint of knee and hip. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about um, uh, adults, this is um, a great way to, to do the limb salvage. But when you talk about the young children, um, it's not always uh, the best way to do the reconstruction. So this is a, a stammer. Uh, endoprosthesis with hydroxapatite color. And also they have uh, expandable prothe prothesis for children. So they can uh, measure the, the limb size. So the bone defect augmentation with artificial materials may produce a good functional short-term recovery. But over the time, the durability of artificial materials become an issue, mostly in young patients and those patients who live more than 10 years. So our patients are living more. They are going to college, they are studying, they are getting married, children, they are doing sports, and we have other kinds of problems and the prosthesis failure, multiple surgeries, infection, and limb dysmetria. So in the past 50 years, we had a great advance with the endoprosthesis and as well as the, uh, the reconstruction with biological uh, uh, allografts. So we have the reconstruction for joint preservation and for segmentary reconstruction. We have allografts, we have vascular fibular grafts, uh, vascularized or not. We have the distraction osteogenesis and the tumor digitalized autografts. So I think uh, uh, this last autograft, uh, it's not done all over the world. Uh, it's a technique that uh, Dr. Tisishia started in Japan, I think maybe more than 20 years ago. It's the frozen bone. And in this technique, he first uh, used the segmentary resection. Then he used to put the, the bone with the tumor inside the bucket of uh, nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, frozen bone, unfrozen the bone and put it back uh, to the surgery. Nowadays, his own technique evoluted with the pedicular bone. And we also, we are also uh, doing uh, only one resection with pedicular bone. Uh, another uh, evolution from, from now is that we can we do the resection transepiphysis um, and we were only able to do that after we have a good MRI. So 
we know where is the 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 tumor and so biological reconstruction they are not all perfect and the prosthesis are not all perfect uh, i think we have a lot uh, to improve uh, the problems of biological reconstruction are infection fractures and mostly no union so in the future uh, now we have the 3d printing implants and i hope and uh, now we have the 3d implants uh, metal implants but i hope that someday we can print uh, bone tissue maybe uh, we don't know So what about the soft tissue sarcomas? Um, I think we are in different steps with soft tissue sarcomas and bone sarcoma. Uh, we have a lot to know about soft tissue sarcomas because uh, we still need to do a better diagnosis with the pathologists so they can help us a lot. Uh, we have problems with soft tissue covert marginal resections and tumor resistance to chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And I think we can improve a lot uh, if we do uh, a more accurate diagnosis in the soft tissue sarcomas, then we can improve our treatment as well. So I brought one case to discuss with you. It's a soft tissue sarcoma in a kid, a five-year-old kid that came to me just last month. And he has a, a tumor in the Botox here. Uh, and he has a lot of pain. And this mass is compressing his sciatic nerve. And I don't know if you all can see in the MRI has a mass in the soft tissue. And I don't know, uh, the radiologists, um, do you have any hypothesis of this tumor? Is he here? No. Uh, so, uh, when we discussed this case, uh, the first thing that um, came in my mind uh, that it was a, a soft tissue sarcoma, maybe a uh, hypodermia sarcoma because of his age. But when we were discussing, we thought about a soft tissue sarcoma, a low-grade sarcoma, a hypodermia sarcoma, and a desmoid tumor. So we kept the investigation and uh, this patient has no metastasis, uh, no lesion in the bones. So we performed uh, the biopsy. And by the time I sent the, the biopsy to the pathologist, it was very hard for him uh, uh, to tell me the diagnosis. So. I brought this case, if you can help me. Um, can You can see, right? Yeah, sorry. Uh, here in the computer is a little bit better. Okay. Outside, it's a soft tissue lesion. I, I, I would need to, to do a 
Okay. So I don't know if this helped you. Okay. Yeah, it's a great test of strength. It reminds me the qualified by the two. Yeah, it's a very point And I don't think it's kind of very some of those vessels Sometimes it can have a, a background, a, a very serious background. Actually, we, we prefer that thing because it's more, it's yeah. more, more specific. Right. And it's a possibility. So it's a curious tumor with a, a, a curious background. It can also be, it can also have a low microtic uh, index and low, low, low attitude. Okay. okay. So, yeah, for our pathologist, is a desmoid tumor, as you told. But uh, in our discussion, uh, he thought oh, it's a, a low-grade sarcoma or it's a desmoid tumor. So he just told me last week that it was a desmoid tumor. So this kid has this big lump, and he has a lot of pain. Uh, it's compressed the sciatic nerve and I thought uh, what can I do do I do the, the surgery straight away or can can I do something uh, before the surgery do you have any experience any different drugs yeah. thank you very much sorry I'm going to remove my mask it's a pleasure for me to uh, stay here with you this afternoon. I'm Montiel Jimenez Fuertes. I'm a surgeon, oncology surgeon from uh, uh, this hospital. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we can improve planification in retroperitoneal sarcoma. The problem with retroperitoneal sarcomas is that they grow and they grow a lot. And the thing that we know is the optimal resection is the only way to treat them. Because the quality of the initial surgery is a major prognosis factor uh, for these patients, for these tumors. Even that, as you know, circulator or normograms, one of the points, very important points are complete resection. This is the best prognosis factor, a good resection in the first surgery. That's it. We don't have that about that right now. Why we use 3D technology to achieve a preoperative workout of surgery? Why? We have CT, it's not enough for us. Well, I know that most of you are pathologists, radiologists, and uh, you think in two dimensions. But I'm going to ask you to make an exercise with us, with your brain, to change your mind, to think in two, dimension, two dimensions or three dimensions. Just imagine that, a Rubik curve. If you see into planes, you can see a little bit of colors, a little bit of relationships between all the pieces. But in the CT scan, you have a Rubik cube in only two colors and the relationships are a little bit difficult. Sorry. Much better. 
The problem with that is imagine during the operating theater in your mind to plan your surgery in two dimensions for us is very difficult because it's not the same if you see the Rubik's cube in three dimensions, you can move, you can rot, you can uh, work with everything. You can see all the uh, relationships between the tumor and all the structures. I think it's a good example and, and you can understand us. We are going to see different examples. You have two dimensions here. Well, it's a very big tumor. I, I, I can't play in this artery. I can imagine it's closed everywhere. It's, it's not very big, but it's big enough. I can see, well, the, the liver, the colon, well, it's, it's closed. Here you have the CT scan for this patient. It's a, a liposarcoma of retroperitoneum. Well, I can imagine the, uh, the psoas, the rectum, everything, the bladder. But when I see in these positions, in all positions, all the relationships with the vessels, with the muscles, mm -hmm. with the veins, I can move, I can move it, I can see it in my mind, I can see it during the operation. It changed a lot for us because for us, for surgeons, it's very difficult to imagine two planes in the patient, in our patient. It's the same information. We do that with CT scan. It's the same information. It's not different. But our point of view is a lot of different. It uh, have changed a lot how we manage. This is a simple case. You can see even the spermatic uh, tooth everything, and you can plan better or surgery. Sorry. This is a patient with two dimensions. And this is the surgery that uh, I think uh, the most of people think that I do during the operating theater. That's not real. That is after eight hours of work, we make that. It's not easy, as easy like that. We cannot remove that. So I think most of you uh, think that, ah, this is it's a ball, we can remove it and that's it. No, it's eight hours after uh, starting the surgery, but you are going to see a little bit better. This is the final uh, field of the surgery. You can see the, vein, uh, the cava vein, the aorta, the psoas, uh, not, uh, not all the psoas because we resect it. This is uh, the groin uh, inside, we remove it. Uh, we made the reconstruction with a biological mesh. Mm -hmm. This is a simple case before. Uh, how uh, do we do with uh, extreme cases? You have here an extreme case. A very big tumor. You can see in two dimensions, you see a lot of fat, but you don't see in your mind. I think it's not working very well. Okay. It's a very big mass. And with this imagine, I can plan my surgery because I can see I need to remove the diaphragm, I need to remove the spleen, I need to remove uh, everything. And inside, I can see different areas of differentiation of the fat probably not well differentiated uh, with uh, no a good differentiation like the other fat after Dr. Merino uh, confirmed that it was uh, different areas. It's not really in very well, I think, sorry. This is during the surgery, it's very, it's very um, um, short, don't worry about that. The tumor, uh, it was very big. It was not enough uh, with a medium laparotomy. It was necessary to make a, 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 a big incision, all the abdomen. Here, uh, it's not ruling really very well, I think, but uh, I'm going to show you only the... I think I'm going to pass because the imagine is not good. So this is the case. This is the patient in two dimensions. 
This is that we see during the operating theater, only a big ball with everything, all the organs inside. This is the final surgery. It's a very big mass. And this is our fill in the end of the operation. As you can see here, uh, we don't have a uh, diaphragm. You can see uh, this is the lung. This is the aorta here, up. This is a uh, um, transverse process. And this is the rest of the muscles of the, uh, of the vac. And uh, after, after uh, it's only the operating theater table. There's no more, no more patient to remove it. Other, kind, other sarcomas, yes, of course. We plan other things with 3D. Sorry, because the connection I think is not working very well. This is a leiomyosarcoma. This is a leiomyosarcoma with uh, the cava vein. It's a very big tumor. You can see it's all the abdominal cava. And with this, we can plan not uh, only the resection, we can plan uh, the reconstruction for the left kidney. We can see in that reconstruction that uh, you can see there uh, that have a little uh, vein uh, who goes uh, uh, making the drain of the kidney. For this reason, we plan the surgery like that. We're going to see if it works. Yeah. I'm going to put uh, this one because it's a real situation during the operating theater. Oh, no. Sorry, because the connection. This is a, a real situation in our operating theater. Nine hours of surgery for this patient. The problem is that uh, when we open the abdomen, we see all the structures together. And we need to go in making a sculpture of the tumor with our uh, right angles and with our, with our uh, fingers and with everything. So it's very difficult to see, to imagine a CT scan in two dimensions when we open because it's, everything is close, like a ball, big ball with everything, good things, bad things inside. Here we are dissecting the aorta. Sorry, because uh, the connection is not doing very well. This is the cava, the tumor. As you can see, we, may, we don't see the cover, we don't see the tumor. It's, it's not like a, in the CT scan. We make a cake all together with everything. And we need to make a dissection with the imagine that we have in our mind, in our brain. We imagine the, the CT scan and we put this in our patient, but with the 3D reconstruction, we can see it. It's easier for us. As you can see, we are making the dissection of the inferior vena cava. Now we can see it because we make the dissection of everything. This is the kidney, the right kidney, we remove it. Nine hours of surgery, so this is the ureter, ureter. we could. Now to the top of the liver, to the suprapathetic veins, and a very important part of the surgery because the reconstruction, we know it that we have a accessory uh, vein of the uh, left kidney and that the inferior vena cava, it was completely closed. 
For this reason, we passed the inferior vena cava. We uh, saw that the patient was doing fine without any hemodynamical instability. And for this reason, we could complete the inferior vena cava with the tumor close to the superparty veins, very close. This is an automatic uh, staple to close the cava into good. And in this moment, we had a cava out in the top. Now we are going to cut the inferior part. The imaging is completely different. That, uh, that we started the surgery. Sorry, I'm going to, to stop it because it's not ruling uh, very well. And this one is a, a, a left a renal vein that we closed. We didn't make the reconstruction because we know it with 3D reconstruction that we have an accessory vein. It, it was very important for us. So the point is that we started the surgery with that. In the CT scan, it's not real for us um, uh, at all in our mind and in our field, in surgical field. We see a cake in the patient altogether, a, a, the same color, the same um, structure for us. And we make a, with this, with our imagination, and now with a 3D reconstruction, we project in our a surgical field, make a, a, um, a sculpture of the anatomy of the patient and the tumor to achieve this thing. This is the tumor, this is the kidney, and this is uh, the, real, uh, the reality for us. This is the reconstruction. Usually we don't know, uh, uh, we don't use uh, for a postoperative uh, period, but in this case, it's important to show you because we can see the drain of the patient is right now for acigos and acigos system. Boy, it's not working very well. So sorry about that. So even for training and for it, mental education, uh, we can see here. Um, all the uh, drain of the patient, the legs and uh, all the rest of the body for inferior body is going through athigos and hemiathigos to the top. And we have here the accessory renal vein uh, who goes through a splenic vein that we know it before surgery uh, thanks to 3D reconstruction. And for this reason, it was not necessary to make uh, any bypass, uh, venovenous bypass because it was enough for a kidney. In reoperations, in complete previous surgery, this is a, a, a woman that a urologist made a surgery, the first surgery for a tumor in the kidney, but it was a sarcoma. It wasn't complete resection. It was not pseudo compartmental resection. So we performed the 3D uh, reconstruction uh, to see, and now what? What I'm going to remove? The tumor is not there. I, I, what, I, what I'm going to do right now? I, I can do it as pseudo compartmental resection. So what I'm going to do right now? So we did it uh, to see different um, uh, uh, different um, uh, areas of the uh, faith. And uh, you can see in blue, you can see in red, you can see different things. And we can imagine our resection with that. And we make the guide during our operation in the operating field with that. If you can see, this is the uh, final uh, specimen and uh, with the pancreas, the spleen, uh, and this fat. Usually, uh, we don't remove that fat, but during the reconstruction, we saw different, cons uh, different kind of fat. So, we decided to remove it as well. We made the guide with that. 
Can we use in other types of sarcomas? Of course, sure. We are doing in everywhere. For example, this is a case of a abdominal wall. Uh, we see uh, we saw a sarcoma here, and we didn't know how was uh, it uh, how um, the resection need to be. For this reason, we made a reconstruction and we removed the obliquus major and minor. And as you can see, this muscle is not affected at all. And the fascia is an anatomical frontier for sarcoma. So it's not necessary to remove all the abdominal wall. Maybe we can keep several things thanks to that. You can remove, uh, virtually remove uh, all these muscles and see if it's good enough to make the surgery, if it's affected or not. Visually, you can see it and you can make a measure. You can uh, go through the veins as well with this technology. Um, it's limited, the use of that. So finally, we think uh, 3D technology for surgery is going to change everything. It's changing right now, uh, this technology for imagine, for playing, for doing, for perform, for train, because we can print it and make the surgery before going to the operating theater with print tumors. And uh, for teaching as well, for our residents, for uh, the pathologists, we talk uh, usually with our pathologists and he knows these reconstructions and helps him uh, to go to, uh, through the areas uh, that are um, uh, a, a little bit different. So we think it's going to, to be a big revolution for surgery for us. And in the next future, we are going to make a lot of things with us because the technology, it's, it exists. Uh, in the very, in the uh, next year, probably or two years, we are going to see these images projected with a uh, lens in the uh, surgical field in real time. So it's going to change a lot or uh, make to do the surgery. So we can do it with other kind of tumors, uh, tumors uh, like Da Vinci or other uh, surgeries. But I, we think that it's going to, to change everything uh, for a surgery. So thanks a lot, sorry for, sorry for the videos and for the connection. <laughs> Maybe next time is going to, to do it. And see about the benefit that we can provide from a and microbiology and how we can apply these new approaches and new advantages. Uh, and first of all, uh, identify the cases that can bring uh, some operation therapy is more for chemotherapy, new molecules, targeted therapy, and even thinking about the future of any option of immunotherapy. And that's my pleasure and my honor to, uh, to uh, show this showing uh, with the Corona. And please, thank you. Well, our presentation is the uh, organization in the future with the Corona Resume, the head of provisional employee department in And he has a great experience in. So good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Javier, for inviting me to be here this afternoon. So I'm going to talk about innovation. And there is not a lot of evidence. So the, the information that I'm going to show you, it's about a small series not in a follow-up, but I, I think it is hypothesis generating for future changes, okay? The first thing I'm going to talk is what is hypofractionation. Very, not everybody of you are, are very familiar with this term. What types of hypofractionation do we have? Do we have moderate, extreme, also called SBRT or SABR or ultrafractionation? And just a final glimpse about what is a special, a special fractionation of the therapy. I think it's the future, but it's been around for several years because the first paper that I have shown, uh, I have found it uh, speaking about the uh, hypofractionations in 1986. So it's a long time ago, but it's been there. It's very frequent in rectal, it's very frequent in prostate and in lung, but it's not so, so frequent in, in sarcomas. Okay, so conventional. 
conventional radiotherapy is given in 30, 30, 30 to 33 fractions if we would do it post-operative. And if we go to pre-op, it's 25 to 28 fractions. When we call, uh, when we do hypofractionation, is the delivery of fewer, larger doses up, uh, up uh, to two grades per fraction. And it has a potential strategy to improve the dose intensity. So we do reduce dose, larger fractions per size, reduce time, and this has several advantages. If we speak about uh, moderate uh, hypofractionation, we speak about fractions of 2.5 every day. And when we talk about SBRT, we're speaking about bigger fractions, six grays per day. And the treatment lasts for five to eight days. So it's moderate, it takes around three weeks to four weeks to complete the treatment. When we talk about SBRT, we talk about one week or two weeks if we do it in alternate days. Spatial fraction is the radiotherapy. It's a, it's a new concept that is coming for larger tumors. I will give you a, a brief uh, information about that. So if you go to Fox 6, this is how they present what is hyperfractionation. In the right side, you see normal, uh, normal fractionation. It takes six to eight weeks. But if you go to hypofractionation, the treatment uh, lasts for one week or depending of, the, of the, the type of hyperfractionation that we give. But it is roughly one week in breast. We're doing now one week now, no three weeks. So things have changed very fast. And hypofractionation is coming very popular in some, uh, in some ana anatomical uh, areas. But we give less dose, what is the key balance? So just to, to have an informative for you, if we give five times five grays, 25 fraction is equivalent to 40 grays for four weeks of radiation. If we give five times six grays, it's about 50 grays of so five weeks or six weeks of radiation therapy. And if we give uh, five times six, seven grays, it's about giving 60 gray in conventional fraction. So, so we give less doses, but it's the biology effective dose is very similar to the doses that I have presented here. So what is the indications? Efficacy. We, if we give larger fractions, the treatments may be better. Treatment package, the duration of the treatment is much lower. So it's very convenient for our patients. So patients traveling far away from radiation oncology units have a better treatments if they last for one week or for two weeks. Elderly patients, these are fragile patients. It's not very convenient for them to come to radiation oncology units. And age, it's very important sometimes in, in sarcomas. Costs five times is not, it's much cheaper than giving 25, 33 fractions. So, and also when we want to combine regimens, when we combine radiation with adriamycin, it's not so, so, it's not so nice. So if we have a, a regimen that it takes only one week, it's better to interdigitate chemotherapy and radiation. So it's it has several advantages that I think it's important to change our minds, how we treat our patients with radiation. What we have published, as I said before, no large series, not uh, long follow-ups, but all of them combined with chemotherapy and the time from uh, the end of radiation to surgery takes the same amount of time, three to five weeks if you give this, but some of them, as you can see, you can complete radiation in five or eight, for 10 days. So this is convenient. I think it's in the times that we're living, facing this time of, of treatments, it's very, 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 it's a new thing. It's not popular. It's, it's more popular in other anatomical sites, but in sarcomas, I think it's important. When we go to the results, it's the same. Local control is in the upper 90s. So it happens. Most of the data that I'm going to show you is extremity sarcomas, not retroperitoneal. Okay, so this is why the local control is so good. Okay, so it's in the upper 80s, upper 90s, with very good survival. So by changing the fractionation, by changing the days, it does not seem to change the results. Okay, this the follow up is not long enough, and the number of patients is not enough. But it gives you an idea that the results are not changing by changing. The fractionation. So let's go to elderly patients. Okay, so this is a small series, 18, page, 18 patients with 
over 75 years, okay? Five times five grays, 25 grays. So most of these tumors were a little bit bigger, more than five enough, uh, five centi centimeters. The median time to survival was four weeks, okay? So it's very similar to the conventional radiotherapy. And the amount of wound complications is around 20%. So it's also very similar to what happens with conventional radiotherapy. So it doesn't change the postoperative of these patients. No responses because uh, this dosage is equivalent to 40 grays, but most of these patients have uh, free margins and two local failures out of 18. So in, in a population which is sometimes difficult to come to our radiation oncology unit, I think this is a good idea. And these patients were treated with 3D conventional. So we can improve, we can give uh, different uh, types of radiation, but even with the more simple technique that we have, we can achieve very good results. And these tumors are big. This is the, well, the largest uh, published series that we have with uh, uh, extremity sarcomas and it comes from Poland. These are the ones who started uh, the, the short course radiation therapy in rectal cancer. So they have a lot of experience in, in rectal. So they extrapolated these two sarcomas. The same dose, moderate doses of uh, moderate hypofractionation. 96% of these patients were treated with 3D conventional radiotherapy. So they, these are not uh, new techniques or modern techniques but very good results in terms of local failures, very good results in terms of wound complications, and a five-year overall survival of 63%. So in conclusion, they said that it's good local control and good tolerance. So it is something that we might consider. Not everybody uh, received chemotherapy, but uh, it's something that in 300 patients, it, it gives you an idea where we are. We can combine it also with uh, other techniques. Hyperthermia is also very, well, it's very popular among radiation oncologists. We need a little bit longer uh, schedules of radiation therapy. If we, if we give it in one week, it's not enough. We need at least two weeks in order to give four fractions of hyperthermia. Switching back to SBRT, we're going to a little bit higher doses for fraction. These patients are, uh, are treated in five to eight fractions in one or two weeks. The doses, uh, per, uh, the daily doses are over six, eight, over six grays. And we can use it in two contexts, oligometastasis. Uh, we have the experience in other locations, lung metastasis from many other sites, and the preoperative setting also. It's coming because it's a very convenient treatment as well. With regards to lung metastasis from sarcomas, again, there is a lot of experience, but here, the fractions that we give is around one to five, and the results are impressively good. Also in the upper 90s, local control. So once we give, we change the fractionation, we think that uh, sarcomas are radio resistant, but if we change the fractionation, if we change the methodology that we use, everybody, uh, most of these patients are radio sensitive. So changing the fractionation gives you an idea what we can achieve in terms of local control, okay? And it's very similar what happens in other locations. Lung metastasis from many other sites produces the same amount of local control with less to with few toxicity. So the amount of severe toxicity is less than 5%. So if this is a very good treatment and it's coming a very popular because many centers are changing from surgery to radiation oncology because it's one day, three days, five days of, of surgery, no post-operative, and some of these patients may need further treatments. So avoiding surgery, it's good enough to think what is the next step. Also, we can use it in brain. These are all serious from sarcomas, not uh, specifically for sarcomas, okay? So the results in brain or spine meds are very similar to what we achieve in other locations. So again, good local control, few side effects. What do we do in terms of pre-op in extremity sarcomas? There's different approaches I'm gonna show you by pushing the dose. 
40 grays in five fractions. This is almost 70 to 80 grays in conventional fractionation. I don't think this is a good idea because in this is a group of uh, coming from Brazil. Okay, they've had very good histopathological regression, 21%. Most of these patients were treated only with radiation, not with chemotherapy, but they had severe toxicity. Three patients, this articulation by vascular occlusion. And the patient that they had severe toxicity, they had 26, 15, and 40, 14 centimeters. So I don't think to push the dose, it's the, the best idea when you are treating uh, bigger tumors. Local recurrence, 0%, and they said, okay, this is good, but you, you have to be careful about what happens with late vascular toxicity. Perhaps the dose is important. If we go a little bit less to 35 five fractions, also combined with chemotherapy in the high-grade uh, high uh, uh, tumors, the results comes a little bit better. So again, if we select the dose, we select the patients, we can combine it with chemotherapy, but we're having no problems with one complication, well, higher problems than that we should expect. Fibrosis is low enough. It's very similar what happens to radiation oncology and also the in, in conventional radiation oncology. And also the functional of these extremities is, is very good. So it's very similar, okay? So I think this is the way we should go. The other way we should go is in high grade, also 15, 18 patients. This is something that we don't like in radiation oncology is to do concurrent chemo radiation in sarcomas. But here I have, well, there is a good idea how things could go in the future is three new adjuvant cycles with chemotherapy. And starting in the second cycle, we do the hypofractionation 25 frames in five fractions, okay? The follow-up of this series also coming from Brazil. It's, uh, well, it's very good. Only one patient presented with local relapse, 33 patients, no residual variable tumor. So very good pathological response. So given low doses of radiation, concurrent chemo gives you better, very good responses in this uh, type of in, the, in sarcomas, okay, six patients, 33 percent developed wound complications, okay, and with regards to toxicity, no upper events reported. So this is maybe the way to combine uh, hypofractionation with chemo, okay. It's much better to do it three cycles, program the chemotherapy as should be because you take care about systemic disease and interdigitate there a short course of radiation and this is uh, with very good results. So we have to be very careful. It's only 18 patients. This is an idea where we could go in the future. Immuno is coming also to sarcomas. Immuno is coming also to SBRT. So this is another idea. Stereosarc is combining immunotherapy with SBRT, three to five fractions. This is to mention that it's important in other locations, but also is coming could be important in oligometastasic patients, okay, with one to five metastases for to explore the, the, the role of uh, SBRT, okay? And finally, I'm gonna speak a little bit what is special, spatial radiotherapy. It is, this is also very important for, for bigger tumors, sarcomas many times are bigger. So what we do is to do, if you, we create, small spots of high dose radiation, okay? So in these spots, we give in a single dose 24 grays. It's equivalent to 50 gray. And then after they continue with 50 grays in 25 fraction. It's another way of exploring how to increase the dose without damaging the tissues. This is most of the series that we have as our exploratory. We don't have, a, 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 well, solid information with regards to toxicity. But I think it's a good idea to create hot spots in the tumor in order to create a bystander effect inside of the tumor to explore the, the, the how to increase the dose without increasing the toxicity. So with regards, if, if this is the next future, I would say no. Why? Because it's, it's current practice. It's been done. We do a lot of SBRT in lung. We do a lot of SBRT in brain, spine, liver, 
So it's current practice in expert institutions. So it's something that we have to take up and to take into account. But the most important thing to for hyperfractionation is how we select our patients. In which patients may benefit of this hyperfractionation? Well, in those in which time is important, right? travel distances to radiation units in the world that we're living is it's quite complicated sometimes. Age is important, okay? So this is another group in which could have a role. Volume is important. So we can do SBRT very nicely in small lesions, but if we push the dose in bigger doses, we have seen that there may be damage to the vascular tissue, okay? And also in oligometastasic, uh, it's, it's also very important to create new interactions between new drugs and uh, short courses of radiation, intense short dose uh, courses of radiation that may benefit to our patients. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna uh, speak on new molecules are, uh, in development in sarcoma. I think this is a very interesting field. Uh, I will discuss on several drugs we currently have in, in development in within our unit. And uh, it is just to, to see that, that things are changing and advancing in sarcoma, even if the perspective from uh, maybe from other oncologists dedicated to other diseases is that sarcoma has not changed, but it has changed a lot and it's changing every day. So as you all know, sarcomas are very rare tumors and in general rare tumors have uh, a worse prognosis than other more, more um, common entities. And this is due to several factors. One of them is that uh, there is less investment in research, less clinical studies, less molecules in development. And currently, the prognosis of advanced uh, patients with advanced soft tissue sarcoma and advanced bone sarcoma is still poor. Those with soft tissue sarcoma uh, in general lived less than two years, and those with bone sarcoma even less, around one year. So the prognosis is still dismal for this population. Uh, happily, several new molecules are now in the last, last, last uh, stages of clinical development in phase three or phase two, phase three trials. And uh, mainly these new drugs are based on a specific molecular mechanism in a specific entity. So in this year, the, the molecular background we have gained has led to um, development of a specific new therapies. So we will uh, briefly discuss uh, options in uh, all soft tissue bone and locally aggressive entities. Let's start for soft tissue sarcomas. And uh, as you all know, there are more than 70 different entities uh, within soft tissue sarcomas. Classically, patients with advanced soft tissue sarcomas have been managed with chemotherapy. And uh, classically, a, a decade ago, it was uh, all, all fits for one approach, but now it's a very much more individualized approach. Indeed, the several, uh, the last approved drugs in soft tissue sarcomas are, have been approved for a specific histologic subtypes, for example, erivalin for liposarcoma and afsirolimus for pecoma or tathemetostat for epithelial sarcoma. So uh, we have clearly changed the paradigm of management the, of these diseases. In the last uh, decades, the, in the last, I would say uh, six to eight years, a, a lot of uh, molecular targets uh, have been in development and some, uh, as I already said, have been approved. So, uh, I would focus just in one of the families that I think are more interesting in soft tissue sarcomas right now, which is MDM2 inhibitors. As you all know, MDM2 is uh, a protein which uh, blocks the activity of P53. So in those patients with amplified function of MDM2, P53 is not uh, doing his job properly. And this is a molecular event, which is a characteristic of some uh, sarcoma subtypes, specifically uh, well the differentiated liposarcoma, but also intima sarcoma and some low-grade osteosarcomas. So several MDM2 uh, inhibitors are being developed, in, uh, specifically in uh, the differentiated liposarcoma MD MDM2 inhibitors are being tested in the first line. This is a disease in which chemotherapy our standard of therapy, which is doxorubicin, is not very active. So uh, any alternative to, to this first line would be very welcome. And if this is the case of this drug, B197828, which is from Boehringer. This is being developed in the first line compared, compared to doxorubicin 
And in this swimmer plot, this is a, these are the data coming from the phase one. You can see that not only uh, liposarcoma patients were included, also from other uh, histologic subtypes, but the best, uh, the, the best results were in this cohort of patients. And as you can see, a proportion of the patients had longer progression-free survivals uh, over one year, which is very, very interesting. Currently, the Brightline study, which is a phase two, phase three study, is uh, open to recruitment. We have the study open in our center. This is a phase two, phase three study, which compares the MDN2 inhibitor uh, with uh, doxorubicin. And I would like to show with you quickly this case report. This is the first patient we have included in the trial. This is a 70-year-old woman, uh, woman with no relevant medical history who uh, went to her a GP last uh, spring because she felt some abdominal discomfort and after several complaints uh, uh, um, um, imaging study was performed identifying this big mass as you can see in the in the in the photograph uh, by a core biopsy confirmed this was a the differentiated liposarcoma molecularly confirmed by the presence of amplification of MDM2 and discussed in our MDT we uh, judged that this patient was not um, manageable with uh, surgery because the, the tumor passed mid, the, mid, the midline, there was vascular involvement, so we decided that it, this was an unresectable, the differentiated uh, uh, lipo, retroperitoneal liposarcoma. So in April this year, she was offered to enter in the, in the trial, she accepted, and the, in the randomization, she uh, was allocated to the arm of the MDM2 inhibitor, 20, uh, 30 milligrams uh, once every three weeks. She has tolerated excellently the therapy. And this is the figure after just two cycles, so two capsules of this drug. You can see here that the, when the uh, disease was multinodular. There were, this is the biggest mass, but there, was, there were other implants. And after just two of these cycles, all the lesions have decreased in size. He hasn't reached yet the partial response criteria, but I think she will, she will achieve this criteria. And which is more important, she has clinically improved and the toxicity is, is uh, mild, if I, if I have to say something, because she doesn't have any toxicity at all. So I think these are very promising drugs. I, of course, I don't, I don't know which is gonna happen with the trial, but I, I think it could be positive because chemotherapy is not so active in this uh, scenario. So this could be a new standard of therapy in the first line of the, the differentiated liposarcoma. These drugs are also being developed in second and further lines. This is the case of the MANTRA study, which compares another MDM2 inhibitor called milademethan versus one of the current standards of care in second and further lines, trabectidine. And we also have this trial open in our center, and uh, uh, let's see uh, the results in the next future. So going further and changing to bone sarcomas, um, the situation in, in advanced bone sarcomas is even worse. Patients have a very uh, poor prognosis. And uh, the results of the second and further lines in advanced osteosarcoma and uin sarcoma in the best of the cases do not achieve the median progression free survival of six months. Last week in Chicago, in the plenary session, the, the results of the recurrent study were uh, presented showing that high dose ifosomite seem, seem, uh, seems to be the most active regimen in advanced Ewing sarcoma, but even in this case, the median progression of free survival was 5.7 months, so not very good uh, results. In the uh, last years, there has been an interest for the combinations of chemotherapy with CDK4 inhibitors in Ewing sarcoma, and indeed, we are about to open a clinical trial with the combination of Temiri plus Abemaciclib, and in the last, I would say, three years, there is a lot of interest in a new molecule, which is still called by the, the numbers, TK216, TK which is an interesting drug because it's a new mechanism of action. It inhibits the transcript, the fusion transcript characteristic of you in sarcoma, AWS FLY1. So this is a new family, new mechanism of action, and, and there are uh, many hopes on this new drug. In osteosarcoma, the situation is similar, very poor results from second and further lines. 
And in the last year, probably the, the most interesting options are focused on the combination of antiangiogenics and chemotherapy. But I would like to spend one, one more minute on, on, the, on two other entities, which are Cordoma and chondrosarcoma. Cordoma is one of the most rare sarcomas. It's an ultra rare sarcoma because there's less than one new case is diagnosed per million of, of people a uh, year and is a very challenging disease with a high risk of local and local regional relapses, but also metastatic uh, potential with development of metastasis up in 40% of cases with a longer follow-up. Is that this is an orphan disease because it has no drug approved and it's chemo resistant. So we have um, scarce options for systemic therapy in patients with advanced disease. There have been small clinical trials with uh, uh, several uh, TKAs such as imatinib and sorafenib and also EGR EGFR inhibitors are being developed. One of the probably most interesting molecular pathways in Cordoma is the cell cycle, CTK4 and 6. Uh, there are preclinical data showing that uh, CTK4 and 6 inhibitors are active in uh, Cordoma cell lines. Uh, there is also proof of the expression of CDK4 by immunostochemistry, and there have been described and frequently mutation in CDK2 and two, uh, CDKN2A, which is the gene encoding P16, uh, have been uh, described. So now we, uh, within the Spanish sarcoma group, we have uh, uh, amended the phase two trial palvosarc, which was before planned for soft tissue sarcoma in order to um, start a cohort specific for Cordoma. And we are currently recruiting Cordoma patients treated with palvociclip with the standard doses of palvociclip. So we still just have a couple of patients included, but I think we have seen encouraging results in, in those patients who enter in the study in progression and achieve stabilization of disease. The other challenging disease in bone sarcoma is chondrosarcoma. Chondrosarcoma is in adult population, the most frequent bone sarcoma. It usually arises in lower limbs and pelvis and the, sometimes the, the, the volume of the disease is very big, moreover in pelvic tumors. So they have a risk of local relapses, which is not low. Uh, conventional chondrosarcoma is an, a spectrum of biological behaviors, which goes from grade one, very easy, um, um, indolent tumors to grade three aggressive and with a high metastatic potential tumors. And the extreme of the, of the spectrum is the differentiated chondrosarcoma, which is a very bad prognosis disease. It's, this is another orphan disease without a specific approved therapies. We used to manage these patients uh, in a similar way of to osteosarcoma patients, but the results we obtained with the same regimens are much poorer. So it's an unmet, an unmet need we have in this disease. And in the last years, um, uh, there has been an uh, interest focus on uh, a family of molecules which are agonists of DR5. DR5 is a, is a component of the trail family, which is a pro-apoptotic um, uh, pathway. So this agonist, and specifically, this is the number of the, the name of the drug, in Brick 109 I, I lost one, one here. Uh, Imbric09 stimulates apoptosis in this uh, cell of chondrosarcoma. And I would like you to see this swimmer for, swimmer for plot, which comes from the um, data of the chondrosarcoma patients included, included in the phase one trial of this drug. As you can see, many of the patients achieve very prolonged disease control. This is a, a very good new in this population, but which is more striking is that some of these patients had uh, objective responses. 11% of patients achieved partial response, but 61% of patients had any kind of tumors linkage, which is something we scarcely see with chemotherapy, with conventional chemotherapy. The median progression free survival in these 20 patients was 7.4 months. And now uh, the, the Condragon study is, uh, is running, is a randomized phase two trial, randomizing patients to Imbrix 109 or placebo. This is a trial we have opened in our center. And this is very interesting because we, the alternative of therapy for this patient is known. 
Uh, so every uh, every patient with advanced chondrosarcoma, to my view, should go included in this trial. This trial allows crossover if the patient has been assigned to placebo. So all the patients are going to receive the drug, and I think it, it's worth to attempt. Finally, I would uh, spend some minutes on locally aggressive entities. These locally aggressive entities and mesen are mesenchymal uh, diseases, which do not have or have a very low metastatic potential, but this doesn't mean that uh, the, the life of patients is not impaired by them because these diseases can cause much pain, can uh, impair its fun their function. And uh, as a result, these patients have a decreased quality of life. So it's also an unmet need. Examples of these locally aggressive diseases are desmoid tumors, tenosynovial giant cell tumors, and giant cell tumors of bone. I will just focus in the two first entities. And starting for the desmoid tumors, uh, as you probably know, this is an entity that, that never metastasize. So if a, a so-called desmoid tumor developed pulmonary metastasis, review the, the, the diagnosis because it's not a desmoid tumor, but these patients can be really symptomatic due to the disease. Uh, frequently, they are very young. Uh, it's, this is a, a disease more frequent in women. And uh, characteristically, many of the patients relate the arisal of the mass with a trauma, could be a, surgery, a previous surgery or chronic traumatisms, or there is any kind of hormonal stimuli, for example, pregnancy or uh, contraceptive hormonal therapies. They can arise uh, in all the somatic body, being abdominal worm and limbs, the most uh, frequent sites, as well as intra-abdominal. From the molecular point of view, almost 90% of the cases are sporadic and they are characterized by the presence of mutations of beta-catenin and at 10-15% of the cases are within uh, hereditary syndromes in, in specifically polyfamiliar adenomatosis, uh, familiar polyposis adenomatosis with APC mutations. So whatever the mechanism, uh, if it's beta-catenin or APC, mutation, the result is the an excessive translocation of beta-catenin to the nucleus and an enhanced trans uh, stimulation of the gene transcription leading to cell proliferation. So in the last years, there have been several consensus papers uh, guiding the, the management of the small tumors. And there, there is now a general accept, acceptance that the initial management of the small tu tumors have be based on the way, uh, way, watch and wait approach, uh, reserving systemic therapy for those progressing or symptomatic patients. We have data on several uh, tiki eyes, uh, such as sorafenib and pazopanib, also on uh, low dose chemotherapy. And also, there have been uh, retrospective, mainly retrospective studies on hormone therapy. In the last years, there is an increasing interest in another pathway, which is NOTCH. NOTCH pathway has a crosstalk with wind beta catenin pathway. And this, uh, this, this um, notch pathway results as well in an increase in an enhancement of uh, transcription, gene transcription when it's translocated to the nucleus. Gamma secretase is, a, is an enzyme critical in, in the function of this pathway. And in the last year, several gamma secretase inhibitors have been, uh, have been developed to, to explore the blockage of this pathway. So specifically in this my tumor, there are already data, prospective data of this family of tumors in small phase one trials. This is the case of one study published in 2017. And in, as you can see in the waterfall plot, the majority of pa patients experience any kind of tumor reduction with uh, a, a increasing doses of gamma secretase inhibitors. So currently uh, we have open in this center, the phase two, three trial ring site, uh, in which uh, a gamma secretase uh, called L, still LA102, the, it, it hasn't has a name yet, uh, is being tested. In the first part of the study, three different doses of the drug have been compared in a randomized phase two uh, part. And now we are waiting to the open of the phase three part, which is gonna compare the chosen dose with placebo. In the second part of the study, patients uh, older than 12 years could be uh, um, included in the trial, and they have to be in progression 
And uh, so I think in this context of symptomatic desmoid tumors in which alternatives are TKIs or chemotherapy, it's worth also to test new, new options. And finally, passing to the, the last entity I would like to discuss, tenosinovial giant cell tumors, also known as giant cell tumors of the tendon shelf or uh, also pigmented uh, vision nodular synovitis. is a locally aggressive disease arising in the synovial of joints and its molecular characterized for rearrangement in CSF1. This uh, rearrangement uh, implies the activation, the aberrant activation of uh, inflammatory uh, reaction within the, within the joint. And this inflammatory reaction is finally related with a destruction of the, of the joint. As a consequence of that, patients have pain, stiffness, and the important joint destruction, um, early arthrosis, and they sometimes have to undergo um, joint replacement. This is a typical MRI of uh, synovitis. As you can see, this is not a well-defined mass. It's more an anthroctose uh, mass. And this is a, a real clinical image of one of our patients in our previous institution. He was a 20-year-old uh, male with this uh, synovitis in, the, in his knee. And he had really, he had bad problems with much pain, and he was uh, he was uh, able to to walk, and of course he, he couldn't do any sport. So in the last year, several CSF1 inhibitors have been tested. Some of them are are very are not very specific, such as imatinib or nilotinib, who have several other targets. But there also have been several uh, monoclonal antibodies. And probably the drug in which we have more data now is pexidartinib. This, this uh, uh, CSF1 inhibitor was developed in a phase uh, three trial called ELEVEN. And the results from this clinical trial led to the approval of this uh, pexidartinib by the FDA but it hasn't been approved uh, in Europe due to hepatic uh, toxicity concerns. But if you can see, if you see here the figures, both the uh, waterfall plot based on resist and the waterfall plot based on tumor volume, you can see that the majority of patients experience improve, improvement in their disease. And it translated in the clinic in important uh, clinical improvements. This is the same patient that I showed you before. This patient, after starting therapy, had a very quick clinical response. He was able to walk the same, the, the, the month after he was able to run, the, the month after he was able to go to the gym every day. So uh, clinically, it was very active and this drug works. So Another clinical, another CSF1 inhibitor, Binseltinib, it already has a name, but it's a very strange name, uh, from the Cyphera, is being developed. We are already in the phase three trial, and these are figures coming from the phase one and phase two expansion cohorts. As you can see, the majority of, well, all the patients with the exception of this one, had uh, tumor reductions. And in our experience, because we participated in the phase one trial, it is clinically also very active. Uh, as already said, we also have this clinical trial open in our center. This is a motion study, and it's currently recruiting adult patients with this diagnosis. And patients are randomized to bimseltinib versus placebo. And after that, if they have been allowed to uh, um, assigned to placebo, they can receive the drug in an open label uh, basis. So to conclude, hoping not having uh, said many things, uh, the, as a conclusion, the improvement in the molecular background we have in sarcoma is bringing new therapeutic options for our patients clinical research and translational research are key for uh, the improvement of, of sarcoma patients outcome. And to my view, providing access to these clinical trials to our, our patients is, I, I, I have put highly recommended, but for me, it would be mandatory because they, they really can benefit from these new drugs. So that's, that's all, thank you. Dear chairpersons, dear colleagues, uh, I am very aware about the, the time about the Friday in the afternoon and about the, the latest talk in this uh, brilliant session about the innovative approaches in sarcoma in general. So we will uh, share this talk in a allegro vivace tempo, uh, trying to, to be 
to the point. This is the agenda we will go through if the, okay. Uh, so some introduction, in, in reality, in the first line of advance of the sarcoma, doxorubicin is still the drug um, and the partners that have accompanied the doxorubicin uh, have died. Uh, so we can say that doxorubicin is the black widow because olaratumab, um, uh, phosphamide, evophosphamide, uh, are, have died uh, during this process. So uh, unfortunately, 40 years later, doxorubicin is still the backbone or the only drug in the first line. But it's true, the combinations of doxorubicin plus phosphamide or doxorubicin plus the carbacin can give us more probability or higher probability of overall response rate. And this is important because we can we can um, make different aims uh, because some uh, shrinkage, tumor shrinkage is related with a palliative relief or um, with a higher probability of resection. This is the case in the upper left side, uh, young uh, male patients with synovial sarcoma, very symptomatic. And after one cycle, this is after two cycles, but after one cycle, the patient uh, felt uh, clearly better and without tachymnia. So um, the, the combination makes sense, even when we don't have any uh, evidence that is improving the overall survival, but is uh, an option for these specific aims. And also in the upper right side, uh, synovial sarcoma in a young uh, female patients uh, with involvement of two spaces, paravertebral and intra-abdominal, this was impossible to resect, but after the induction with combin um, uh, combination of doxorubicin plus phosphamide, it was possible. And the, in the bottom line is the same, high grade uh, soft tissue sarcoma in the axilla. In this specific case, uh, impossible to, to make some resection uh, or at least some good resection oncologically speaking. And after the combination, we were able to make this shrinkage and to resect the tumor. But it's true for the most of, tum of, of patients, the scenario will be no symptomatic and no resectable. So doxorubicin alone will be enough because uh, as this case, uh, we have more than 20 nodules in both lungs and asymptomatic. And obviously in this context, maybe the uh, metastasectomy does not make sense. We have known by retrospe retrospective series that the um, partner of doxorubicin in the case of leiomyosarcoma is the carbacin is clearly better in this retrospective uh, view or analysis from ERTC series. So if osmide is not longer used in this context and the carbacin is the preferable uh, partner of doxorubicin. So how can we improve the first line? So one option is the combination of chemotherapy plus anti-PD-1. Uh, just exploring the concept that uh, Thit Bogel and his uh, and her, um, partners described one decade ago. This is an um, a investigator from Gustave Roussy and three nature uh, papers later, he was very convincing um, persuasive that the immunogenic death occur after the doxorubicin administration, for instance. And actually this immunogenic death is restricted with some um, few uh, drugs. Doxorubicin is one of them. That means uh, what, what happens after the administration of doxorubicin? It happens some molecular changes a molecular expression in the surface of the cells, of the tumor cells, that make a call for uh, lymph uh, T cells that is in, in, in other words, is a kind of vaccination or a kind of activation of uh, adaptive um, immune, immune modulation. And uh, the first trial exploring in perspectively, in, in perspective uh, fashion, this concept is this trial with doxorubicin plus pembrolizumab 
And in this context, we can see um, a longer uh, median of progression free survival and a longer disease control. The disease control rate was almost 80%. So this is a um, reasonable, reasonable approach and attractive as well. And this is another uh, case, uh, just compilating cases with retrospective uh, treatments with the same concept of doxorubicin plus anti-PD-1. And again, we can see this is control rate higher than usual than usually we are seeing with doxorubicin alone. It's true that some other approaches as this metronomic cyclophosphamide from uh, Antoine Italiano from Bordeaux is not the same because cyclophosphamide is not um, inducing these immunogenic death changes. Maybe uh, this is important in, in order to obtain good results. So in this way, uh, Immunosac2 trial decided uh, three years ago to activate uh, uh, two extra cohorts just exploring this uh, concept. And this is the, the case for the cohort seven in which we are including two different histologies. And uh, for, for each one, we have a phase 1b uh, trial, UPS and lyomyosarcoma, UPS with epirubicin, ifosomide, plus nivolumab is the first time we will combine a, a combination of chemotherapy, two drugs, plus anti-PD-1. And also with lyomyosarcoma, as I mentioned before, doxorubicin plus dacrabacin, and then also plus nivolumab. The, the first patients have a, a really um, enrolled, especially in lyomyosarcoma, and we are uh, eagerly pending about these preliminary results, but so far, very, very few progressions have been done. So also in the eighth uh, cohort with osteosarcoma, metastatic osteosarcoma, but with the, the primary tumor resectable, we are exploring the combination of MAP scheme, which is the backbone of osteosarcoma um, systemic treatment, plus uh, nivolumab. And we are also very, very, uh, um, I, I would say, very happy with the probability to start with these um, uh, new cohorts. Uh, UK, Italy, and Spain are pushing patients, are enrolling patients in this uh, very attractive uh, trial. So uh, we uh, have already known from other tumors where it's true, non-small lung cancer, uh, non-small cell lung cancer uh, is a paradigmatic tumor where the immunomodulation is working well, as, the, uh, as is the case of melanoma. But in this context, the combination of uh, cisplatin, which is also an uh, inductor of immunogenic death, um, uh, we, with combination with anti-PD-1, uh, statistically um, is better in terms of overall survival and in terms of event-free survival. So, so far, the combination seems to be attractive and the, uh, you can look at the difference uh, of a pathological complete response between the combination 24% versus uh, just uh, chemotherapy uh, 2%. So it's very, very um, persuasive. So also in, in the case of lyomyosarcoma, we have recently, we have recently uh, had this, uh, this trial comparing, comparing doxorubicin alone versus the combination of doxorubicin plus trabectidine and then trabectidine as a maintenance phase. And this was presented that, uh, last ESMO meeting and the, the, the numbers, the main numbers were the median of progression free survival six months for the doxorubicin, which is in the, in the range that usually we are seeing for first line, and, but the, for the combination is 12 months. So it's uh, the double time. And maybe when we will have mature data, uh, maybe this will be translated into the longer uh, overall survival as well. So it's true for the first six cycles, there, there is higher toxicity with the combination, but with the maintenance phase, because uh, they were using 1.1 milligram meter square for trabectidine is extremely well tolerated. So uh, this is not uh, a problem. How can we improve the second lines? One thing here, and this is uh, an innovative approach from our team 
is the combination of tobectidine plus radiation therapy. And one um, important issue for, for this radio sensitization is that tobectidine has two main properties. For one side, tobectidine is able to make a rest in G2M, which is the most, the most important uh, part of the cell cycle where radiation therapy is more effective, but also uh, because initially tobectidine is behaving as proliferation factor, which is very, very rare for a chemotherapy agent. So, but this is the case. In the first three hours, we are able to see uh, some signals that indicates mm, that the cells are entering in cell cycle. So this is very, very uh, striking finding, but we can also be more uh, convincing uh, seeing videos uh, recording where we are seeing uh, uh, proliferation in this uh, cell culture. And also, as, as I mentioned, in G2M is arrest is, is, all, um, uh, is happening because the DNA damage is also an early event after trabectoline. So it's the perfect drug for radio, radio sensitization because many, many drugs are able to arrest in G2M, but we don't know any other drug that will uh, gather these two properties as tropectidine does. So this is also seen with uh, phospho H2AX in, the, the, in, in clonogenic assays as well. So this was the, the design of the, of the one of the cohort of, tri of, of TAS trial. This cohort is focusing on a metastatic uh, setting. And uh, this was a kind of hypofractionation, uh, three grays per 10 uh, fractions. And the, the point was the radiation therapy should start within one hour after the withdrawal, the uh, perfusion of tabectidine. This was important according to also uh, our um, observations in preclinical. And uh, the the striking observation was in phase two, in, in advanced disease, uh, patients not suitable to be treated with SBRT, neither with metastasectomy, uh, the overall response rate was 60% according to the Central Radiological Review, is six times more than trabectidine alone. And this is very uh, striking. And also we have 40 additional patients in the real life with uh, similar results, it's true that the percentage of overall response rate is 30 or 30, I don't remember, 34 or 35 yeah, percent. But it's true also that in the real life, we relaxed the timings of radiation therapy. So uh, increasingly, all over the world, it, many, many investigators are uh, calling us or emailing us saying, we are using this approach and it's incredible. They go, uh-huh, it's incredible. <laughs> yes, we know. Yesterday, we, we saw a Chilean uh, patient, uh, that patient that has been treated in Memorial Sloan Catherine from New York with this, this scheme. And this scheme um, prolonged the, overall, the, the disease control rate for one year. Uh, and this, this was incredible as well. So, and, and we are very happy with this approach and we have designed this, the, the following, the nest with Synergia. And this is the waterfall plot where we can um, see that the shrinkage is, is almost universal. This is resist response. This is not the response of the irradiated nodules, it's the resist response. So this is important. And this has translated it into a longer progression-free survival uh, almost 10 months. In second line, we are obtaining a, at the most four months and also for overall survival. So some examples here with different uh, responses with this combination. We don't know how can describe this kind of response in the bottom line with a black hole or in the upper right side with her, but we have uh, observed this in a wide range of histologies, not only L sarcomas, but beyond this. It's true that in sarcoma, we are collecting patients uh, without progression after two and a half years, which is impressive. 
And this is one of the case. And this, uh, this, uh, this man uh, progressed during the doxorubicin, during the first line, and after trabectadine and radiation therapy make a almost complete response in the, in the, in the local primary bed. And the, the patients, uh, to the best of our knowledge, is still under control um, four years later. So it's impressive. And in this uh, case also is uh, a big uh, bulky disease in the, in the root of that thigh. And after this approach, uh, we can see also a very, very nice, um, very nice response. So the, the, this kind of lesions are not treatable for SBRT, are not treatable for metastasectomy. Another approach is the immunomodulation com in combination. This is uh, an important paper from Nature, Petit Pré, uh, described five different lands in sarcoma regarding the microenvironment in, and regarding the, uh, let's say, the, how prone is the microenvironment to respond to anti-PD1 compounds. And only 20% of cases, this, this red um, column, uh, is considered inflamed. Only this 20% will be responsive to immunomodulation. And this is also tested uh, in a prospective series uh, treated with anti PD1. And interestingly, in this specific uh, subset of patients, there are uh, tertiary lymphoid structures, which are the uh, concurrent findings of dendritic cells, CD3. T cells and CD20 B cells. So this is uh, the best uh, predictive biomarker we have for sarcoma, at least soft tissue sarcoma for anti-PD-1. We know that the combination is better than just anti-PD-1. Uh, this is just uh, the combination of nivolumab plus ipilimumab or antiangiogenic plus um, nivolumab, uh, as we can see in this waterfall plots. It's true that we don't have any randomized phase to the trial. It's indirect comparison. Um, and these are examples. This is an alveolar soft part sarcoma. This specific subtype is the most sensitive to uh, anti PD1 therapy in sarcoma. Uh, we have here two examples. And also, the differentiated, the differentiated like chondrosarcoma is very sensitive, uh, clear cell sarcoma, angiosarcoma. And finally, uh, new um, the, the science um, from our group. This is the enhancer. We are very very proud um, of this of this uh, trial. Uh, hopefully, we'll start in uh, in a soon uh, in upcoming months. And with this uh, combination of this um, LB one hundred inhibitor of this phosphatase in combination with doxorubicin has demonstrated a substantial activity in preclinical in pre setting. It's true that we have to work uh, in a deeper way to, to know what is the final mechanism of action for this uh, combination. This is true that uh, this inhibitor uh, works uh, in different uh, tumors, but depends on the tumor context is different the, the efficacy. And this is the phase one uh, design. And this is the phase two comparative uh, design. So uh, Celisarca also is, uh, for us, is very, very important. We have now finished the, the combination of gencitabine plus Selinexor in the phase one part. Is again, another design from our group. Uh, Celi uh, Nexor is an inhibitor of XPO, which is an exporting from a nuclei to a cytoplasm. And in the phase one, we have uh, observed substantial activity in leiomyosarcoma, very promising activity in the phase one part. So, uh, and there are new strategies here. Um, we can see some of them, but maybe there is no, <laughs> there is no time for entering in, in this. We think, we are very, very convinced that the, the conquer of my confinement in sarcoma will give us new insight for new treatments and uh, qualitative 
a jump uh, for um, for improve the progression free survival and the overall survival. Our group is working on this. Uh, the matrix composition makes sense. Mm, Mark uh, can can be differential factor uh, in 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 soft sarcoma, and it's important to make the dissection of what exact components are in the microenvironment, what kind of matrix is uh, behind these, these tumors. So the remarks are these. Combinations should be more advantageous for immunomodulators. Trabectadine and radiation therapy is safe and exhibits high activity rate. In the next five years, there is room for the optimistic perspective in first and second lines of sarcoma. Vulnerabilities as addiction of some part of cell cycle control or replicative stress sound appealing. Chromatin remodeling complexes alteration seems critical in some sarcoma. And we don't have time now, but these uh, complexes uh, are very, very interesting in sarcoma. And microenvironment conquer is one of the next frontier in sarcoma. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, for me, the, um to the needs for SFRT, okay, because uh, we have right now, it's known to the body the use of SBRT and as well uh, the hyperfraction, but the specific needs for SFRT, SFRT, SFRT and as well for IMRT. Uh, SFRT, what's the role that we, uh, so specifically, well, this is coming here. It's a larger tool, okay, so this is something that we have to start something promising as well. But it's, a, it's mainly indicated for a larger tool. It's a special function. Okay, and in case of amorti, so the reproductive, um, in case of? Yeah, so what, what could be the potential needs of intraperative radiation therapy right now? Good question. Well, I think uh, when surgeons are working on another technique, this indicated the cover practice for parental therapy. And also, it's coming up in a very new in terms of intraperitoneal uh, therapy, therapy which is for trash, and it's giving higher doses per unit of time. And in the next two or three years, there will be devices in clinical in which we can deliver. Um, three times, four times the doses that we are achieving with the having side effects. So the, the, this is, a, is, is, is something that you can do with mental therapy or a therapy. It can be done with electrons or it can be done with, uh, with protons. Okay. But it's something in progress, it is it's something very useful. In external distribution, the surgical models are not appropriate. There is no line of my studies. Carbon tax is as well, simulation, but it's not the standard as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Matthew. So, let me to move to our next lecture about the new molecule that we are currently uh, or coming soon programming in sarcoma. So, and let me to go to the Cordoma example because uh, you have talked about the EFR, EFR expression in Cordoma as well, with use of CDK for six uh, inhibitors. So um, I guess that for those cordoma with high expression EGFR could be potential candidates for being treated with EGFR inhibitors. So my first question is, so uh, EGFR TKI or EGFR antibody, monoclonal antibody? Um, so currently the, the only uh, evidence we have comes from case reports, uh, scattered case reports. They are described response with cetuximab and also with uh, lotinib. And this is one clinical trial currently open to recruitment in several European sites with afatinib. So currently the, the tendency is more for TKIs than for monoclonal antibodies, but the truth is that there are also responses uh, reported with uh, cetuximab. And in this way, so the other sites are the CDK46. So, uh, and I guess maybe for Identifying the patient that can respond much better to this approach. So, do you think that we need the expression of CDK46 uh, to be sure that in case of high expression, CDK46 could be better potential response to these uh, new inhibitors? 
just a secret. I mean, <laughs> sorry, excuse me. No, no, no. Nadia knows as well. Uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 yeah. the scenario in Coloma is uh, the loss of the silicon wave, which uh, happens in 70 percent of cases. So, uh, this lack of P16 makes sense to test CDP4 combination even in the absence of, let's say, over expression of CDP4. Um, so, this is the, the reason we have activated that. A little bit different than this approach we have presented in this summit. It, it, it is also true that there is. Uh, the expression of CDK4 and 6 is being described in, in a high percentage of codons, so they are both mechanisms yeah. in play. Both, both then. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, so a little much more detail in the data that we have uh, talked about the product in transportation therapy, it means that uh, this kind of combination seems to be that the only lesion that has been treated uh, with radiation therapy were able something like an ascopal effect. Uh, so how do you explain, because uh, what could be the insights for new design of this potential approach in the future, because it's something that we need probably to translate a new uh, clinical trial and even more. So how to combine this approach to this drug and radiation therapy and plus combination with immunotherapy. Any options of putting together these different approaches? Yeah, and we are very happy with the class trial because it has been at the same uh, joint design between radiotherapists, oncology radiotherapists, and medical oncologists. And uh, we, we need to talk together around that. And it's very attractive. It's very attractive. Uh, I guess trabectadine or lubinectadine or, or maybe ectobectadine, uh, which are very, very similar compounds, are uh, special compounds in the drug. It's not the same with uh, other compounds with, as uh, uh, the cytamine or maybe absolutely. But uh, maybe they deserve to be strong. Yeah? Excellent. And Javier, so you, you have mentioned as well that LD100 is a very exciting drug that we are waiting for because we have different uh, resources for it together in the lab working about uh, PP2A. So my question is about something that we have discussed uh, several times. Uh, do we need uh, a fine selection mutation regarding PP2A or maybe any sort of marker related to PP2A? To be sure, the patients that can be fed for this drug, and as well, uh, take into account that we have a pleiotropic effect from yeah. PB2A in the tumor cells, in the stromal cells, and even the immune cells. So, how do you expect the potential combination of uh, LD100 with the different drugs, and how, you do, how, how do you draw the future of the clinical trial combining LD100? Yeah, we are very, in the very beginning, we are in a very early um, days. It's true, it's a topic uh, with many different mechanisms of action and depends on the tumor complex, uh, which is more uh, complex. But we expect that um, those tumors with some deficiency in, in, in the DNA damage uh, repair could be mainly interesting for that to be testing. But we know if from the uh, clinical uh, uh, say that the combination of the doctor with in class uh, LD100 is synergistic. So it's in a scenario. Um, so uh, we know that this is working. Uh, our challenge is to uh, know the mechanism for which this is synergistic. Uh, maybe this is an, an option. Uh, another option is uh, uh, overcome the senescence in, in some tumors, maybe inducing uh, mitotic catastrophe. So there are many, many ways we have to follow, um, but it's very intriguing uh, because it's very powerful in the clinical setting in the cell So uh, we know that, which is more important to know that it's working. We need to know why it's working. But um, the will be in, in parallel with the preclinic uh, data, we will collect also biopsies in the clinical trial, both baseline and third 
by our teachers, I don't remember uh, badly. So we will have hair tissue from patients and we will be able to uh, do any kind of translational research mm -hmm. associated to, to see if we can find any predictive factor in these patients. Definitely. And, and, and a last question on career because you have talked about the, the role of PLC2, Polycom. That's really amazing because it's something that uh, is uh, very related with um, G2, um, G2N, uh, cell cycle breaks. And I'm wondering potential combinations of PLC2 and Kibirus plants, uh, something that is much more related to this uh, G2N phase. I mean, uh, our working is B. So, probably, how do you expect any potential combinations for uh, eliciting a much higher migratory catastrophe to my uh, this approach? And, and my question as well is uh, what about the potential uh, toxicity? Because it means that probably I expect uh, my suppression probably exactly. in this case since really this approach. But what's your approach regarding these specific uh, tracks for the uh, G2M? Yeah, it's, it sounds very interesting as well. And we know that the, I, I estimate 60% of sarcomas. They have some dysfunction in these two complex, in these two chromatinium modeling complex, switch to both complementable mm -hmm. and uh, polycom repressor in complex two. So the balance between these two complex should be very high. And if these uh, are uh, uh, different, uh, I mean, uh, loss of function of one of the proteins with this switch to complementable can induce. An over expression of this polycom repressor too. This is the uh, line mechanism of the metastat for epithelial sarcoma, but inversely also. So, this combination, uh, I mean, uh, we cannot use just uh, the metastat uh, in the context of no over expression of this ECH2 catalytic component. Mm -hmm. So, it is a tricky. It is a very, very necessary to, to focus on that because sixty percent, according to my estimation, has of sarcoma have any disturbance in these two complexes. So, as you mentioned, the side cycle control is important for this polycom uh, repressor too, as well. So, we have to be uh, step by step because it's, it's not easy. It's not easy, but it's uh, for sure it's very, very important. And uh, there are. Some new drugs, for instance, in the inhibitors of bromo domain 9, which is maybe important for Shinobi sarcoma, is one of the components of the switch to program for medical, which is usually amplified in, in, in Shinobi sarcoma. So we have to go step by step because we don't know uh, in the absence of any uh, amplification or loss of function uh, how. Uh, how dangerous is to blow with a drug one of these components because the, the immune is very, very important. Great, thank you very much. So, any question or anything from the audience for your closing session? Anything else? Anything else? No. So, I have one question. So, maybe one question about the regular source of drug size. I guess myself a lot of times, and um, if, if we get these results with certain ways that uh, we have we have seen that it's a, it's a, it's a, a great dose to radio radio sensitive effect. I I don't know if we can uh, increase if we can increase the dose. Uh, if we can increase the dose in, in this metastatic setting. Uh, we can achieve uh, a great local control, a great, uh, a great abscobal effect, maybe a, 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 a radio immunogenic effect more powerful. And I don't know if, if, if you consider Dr. Martin Lotto or any of the speakers, if you consider that there is, a, is there a, an option to increase the dose? For increasing the ascopal effect and to promote to increase the, the ascopal effect, to increase the radioimmunogenic effect, 
in, in, the, in the local control with, without a, a, an increase of morbidity. I don't know. So being a strict, we should repeat a phase one trial. I mean, in the phase one trial with 30 days, uh, we saw that there were not toxicity concerns with the combo. Uh, I would be a bit more worried with higher doses in certain uh, locations, in certain sites of disease. We, we have made in, in very selected patients 50 degrees, 50 grays, sorry, mm -hmm. with the trabeculin. And uh, in any of the patients I remember, uh, she had hematologic to higher hematologic toxicity than expected. So I think we should assess this possibility in, in a clinical trial because translating directly to the clinic, our findings with 30 days. I mean, maybe, in, uh, well, we have, we have higher doses in the core D and in the core C of the study, which is uh, the, the core of localized and mycel liposarcoma, in which we have delivered uh, 45 days in 25 uh, fractions. And also in the retroperitoneum cohort, we have data from 45 grays in big masses. So, but we don't have uh, higher doses than, than those. So if you wanna go for, for 60 or, or higher, I think we should assess it prospectively. I don't know what other things. I have experience with trying to learn the data from you can increase in ten I've seen some things in which the dose is not enough, but it is something that you want to do to your life and to do. Maybe four four weeks ago we shared a case from Dilma and a medical oncologist and radiation therapist. And at the time of increasing one level, they decided to relate this level. And then all the other levels, the drum, drum. So this is a pseudoscopal uh, effect because it's with the selection. So we, we have to invent, invent, invent a name, new name for, for that. But this, uh, this phenomenon is seen even with this of Maybe with higher doses, it's easier. Yeah. There is a bit uh, a new risk of major hypotension without uh, with, with, with great volume, but probably not with small volumes, less than five centimeters. And, and probably if we can achieve 80, 100 rates with SDRT, like in other pathologies, uh, we usually do. Probably, probably the, we can increase the testing. That's just an idea. It's an idea for the future. We, we can test that with TM for TM. We will also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, probably the same way that you have mentioned before, uh, I mean, I probably need to take into account the volume of those put together to be super worthy to provide some. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so anything else or any comment already uh, any questions for this really exciting and inspiring uh, table discussion anything else so uh, please drop out this really exciting and inspiring well, thank you well, thank you very much and uh, see you soon